be a mindset where I always have a way of saying that helps me to mobilize others. And computer science takes me to it. And that is what I aim for, and that's what I believe in, and that's the way I do things. Because this is, you know, what I've learned the mindset about this is. And but I really felt that sense of I want to be useful. And so this drove me to work pretty early on in my career. I came over and I did computer science when I was 20, 19 or 20 years old. I went to Munich and New York, I worked there, and went back to France, and at some point decided that I actually didn't feel useful enough in what I was doing at J.P. Morgan because I didn't care if I did it, I would earn more money, which was useful. It wasn't something that was fulfilling for me, and I didn't see any purpose behind that, and I didn't feel like it was that useful. So this is why I went back to study, studied economics, got a master's in complete background about understanding like just about how the society works and the world works, and then ended up in venture capital for random um, encounters. I didn't really know what venture capital was. It was really interesting, and I just wanted to put more um, more value out of my work. And so I met a, met a lot of people, and some of each person told me, well, I'm starting my own company really and just I want to learn more, you know. Uh, your your job is still about understanding technology and I also understand you know finance, the whole accounting stuff. In this two sided thing, so you you're gonna get to very interesting things as a structure, you should touch it. And I like the fact that actually it's partnering with entrepreneurs to make their dreams happen to um, also um, create the world that they dream out of. And so this felt a lot, a lot more useful to me than what I was doing previously. Um, so doing that was really part of the uh, the, the um, criteria that were making me choose this work. Okay, the reason I resigned from J.P. Morgan and I went back to study is because I wanted to learn more about this. And the reason that I stick to venture capital is also because I want to learn more about this. Afterwards, what happened is that at some point I became limited, and that was financial crisis 2008. When um, I went for my uh, went up to Paris, and I went on my own again, and I was in my place. And it was the moment we were starting to build a new bank in my in Saint Gall in France, and I was in my place in Paris. And when I came back to my human team, they had started with this like um, pipeline of prospects to create an investment in Saint Gall. I came back, nothing had changed. I was just getting my message that you know the two guys do not everything can in French. You know, I didn't hear a bit about this in French. They were not really used. Those two who are I mean nobody comes from the same. They were you all these nonsense, you know? It's just not the same world. And I said, Oh, okay. Um, and then went back to Saint Gall again and realized that in front of me, I had financial investors who were telling me, well, it's just, you invest in venture capital, which historically has not such a good financial performance, where there's this asset class here, which is called up with buyout, which is having a lot more, which is a lot more lucrative and, and you know, better performing, so we're going to put more money there. Don't you see that venture is providing a lot more value than just time that is creating the jobs of tomorrow for the future? That is what kind of makes the, econ the economy competitive. So in terms of in institutional terms, you need the economy to sustain, you need the economy to keep changing, and you're doing the complete opposite of that and not putting money and making sure you're investing in the future. And it drove me crazy that all these decisions at the finance level were only taken in the same cycle. And nobody was thinking about the long-term thinking about the world building and the cycle of it. And I mean, it's, it's not only about financial stability, that doesn't do everything. You're feeding yourself a lot. It's just very bizarre. And so to kind of keep more of this and also on the research side to make more of this, I went to something I didn't know of, which is to create 
So this is when I did find out the first time I saw the problem of pumping the pump. This was going towards the Houston investors and entrepreneurs to give space to this other position. And that I, um, the reason being that I felt I needed to show that venture capital had not only a financial footprint, but a place and a time to show it. Because if you go back down there, there's so much data to the government and show them, look, this area here is doing 40% growth and there's 35% growth in employment and the type of job that you're doing are lousy jobs for young people where we have a huge huge unemployment rate and we don't know what to do with that. And it's different type of companies. They are aligning themselves with all these behaviors and it's the future and we should think about this is like me as a pillar for the tenth financial system of the world. The other thing being that if you look at the French economy and it's the same in Europe in general, we have very big companies, but they're super old. Like we have the stock index called the Cap Index, it's the 46 company index. The average years, the average age of these companies is 105 years old. Okay? So we don't have a growth path for entrepreneurs that is possible and, and we don't know how to close the company down. So combining these two things of having a government who doesn't know and doesn't see the potential of the digital economy and also having this economic policy of not having made that growth path possible for venture capital was very frustrating. And so with this is why we got together and tried to work on how to do a better job at it. interesting part in that is it was the first time we were doing this, and the fact that we were going towards this between venture and entrepreneurs gave us a lot of power, a lot more power, because we couldn't be accused of defending personal interests. We were defending the social system in general. And so this is why we had so much influence at the government level, and so the first thing I can remember was the of capital venture growth and capital inclusion, which was crazy for me. So you have to do something, and this is the moment where we really got to be heard by the government because we we received a huge statement from the entrepreneur um, sector that they were really open to venture, and so we got to do it. So we had coffee on on Facebook and on all the different um, wrote letters to the president, and there was this whole set up from the entrepreneurial community because they were saying, you know, we're taking all this risk and we don't understand what this whole thing is about. And that's true because in fact we were an, an entrepreneur is not going to venture capital. The first they didn't they didn't finance with us. So it's a completely different mindset. They just didn't know. And so by doing so, um, I reached the point where I actually changed the position now and here. <laughs> which is not something I would have expected to do, you know, <laughs> in the early days, and it's not something that I can plan and do. But it was really crazy to you that by just learning by doing, basically, and not being afraid of having been in touch with the decision and to and asking questions to the right type of people, you can actually know where you can go with this. And by doing so, I had the chance to set up from my own industry because in advising the government, all the changes that the digital system was bringing to the economy, I had to kind of articulate what the changes were. You know, and I spent my time talking to the CEOs from the various um, um, councillors and, and telling them, you know, this is how transformation, this is how it's going. It's not, it's not a tech shift. It's a complete transformation of the economy, whether they shift the rules and it's the security that we need to maintain, whether um, we're actually don't have that two people, so we need to create this new role, we need to spend the people and this and that. So I had this complete um, understanding that there were different ways of people and telling them what to do. But then I was coming back to my own firm, you know, and saying, hmm, um, am I competitive at this international level? Not at all. You know, uh, am I scalable? Not at all. It's a complete system shift. So I wasn't defining to myself that this is how we're going to do it. And this 
is when came up in other states, in part where basically when you cannot impose change to, um, to do as useful as you want to do within your situation, this needs to be given. And so this is why the key to the case is this uh, central factor model, which is trying to integrate all the changes that the digital economy is bringing to the venture capital world. And doing that, the interesting thing is that in that process that we work on, we are starting from a blank slate. And when we start from a blank slate, then it's not only about how do you want to do your job better, it's about everything's possible. So what, what should we do when we can do things? What is your purpose? If you're building a company, you know, how, what else should you change? It's not only about just improving marketing in your regime as well. It's about what else do you want to do? And completely change the same thing, right? And this is when I started to say, to tell myself, well, actually, when you're investing in, you know, your founder, you're giving him or her more chances than that other founder. And to this point, I'm not trying to put the keys, but I think that other people need to come with you. And so, what is your criteria for success, right? And what happens is, I can, I'm not arrogant, I sit on board most of the time, and if you want to be really helpful, you need to have a blank slate. Right? You need to dig into their businesses, to dig into their human relationships, to dig into their career, to dig into their dreams, to try to be helpful to these kind of folks. And seven companies would be my company in a minute. And it's tiny. You know, how do you want to change the world? Seven companies. So it's a time allocation decision when you're investing and saying, I want to spend more time with these people working on that mission. And I want to set the bar at the level where I feel like I can go with them and build something a little bit better for you. That is going to make it better work for me. And I trust them. And that is the type of a decision I should take as an investor. Not a question of, am I going to earn money? Because if you take a decision on money, then that means you're really earning money. So you're not taking enough time. If you take a decision on the mission, on where really, what really you want to achieve, and how you want to transform the world, then you're going to go somewhere there, and if you succeed, then you're going to go somewhere else. So trying to say, where, what are the types of companies that I feel like I want to work with, and that I really believe in, that I want to spend time on, and who are the people that I can trust to spend those kind of hours with me, for me to make that time useful because people are going to listen to me, because I have the right type of relationship, is really the question that I should ask. So it's putting that purpose within investment decision where those people have to come in because I have to for myself better and for the company that I'm investing in for myself so um, that I can make the team perform better and I have to also kind of achieve the type of outcomes that I'm really going to get. But also it's investing in entrepreneurs that are more resilient because they're not there only for the money as well and during difficult times they could get make the whole team go forward and to be able to overcome all the difficult times that others have on the mission. So having a bigger mission actually makes the decision for me that it's a better trade-off for me to put my money on than to make money. Because people are still looking really at a very ambitious goal. And in doing so, then, I got interested and curious about what actually is the society that we want to build, that we want to build together. Because what are your investment strategies? They're not only about, you know, if you, if you think that, the question when it comes to energy, when it comes to food, it's a complex question. But knowing that, we then have when the country comes to stories we have, is that the state at the moment where 
the fact that the Ninth Circuit had been involved before that, I think, would be nice. Also, Mary Sue had the Tenth Circuit case and other cases advising us on how the district court can maintain its jurisdiction. And we want to do that. And that's why I say that I only do that if I can work on the most significant of the project, a building, a vision of a desirable project. Because what I have seen is that at the society level, the fact that we do not have a common vision of the type of society or city we can build, which we would want to have to build if we want to get the project done in a sustainable way, is making everybody afraid of it. Because everywhere around, if you Google, we're talking about how artificial intelligence is going to take this job. It's going to take a middle class. How global warming is going to hit the planet, and we're not going to have anything to eat in 10 years from now. How there is a lack of research in energy and in fossil fuels, and how are we going to make this whole thing happen? And so everything that is projected in the future is making people afraid of it. And I would say the reason that it's very difficult to put people in their home to work at a site is that we don't know how to imagine it. We don't know how to frame it. And so I think that that's essential. And I tried to take that example, and that I want this whole conference to be built around thinking tomorrow, building the vision about a society we want to build, and that will make us care and treasure more people, and that will have certain sustainable vision. Let's have the digital era and integrating all the challenges we have from an environmental standpoint and social standpoint from a society standpoint. And doing so, I I hope and and I think to do that, we cannot do it only with digital technology. Because the subject of digital health and democracy is the other. That's one of the issues that I think that things that are very concrete and that we need people from the ground to tell the vision of digital health. We need people coming from all these different perspectives and sharing them to be able to build that vision and not come only from the research. We need all, all these legal affairs. We, we need all these visions. And so this is why uh, I designated the 30 people. Ten were coming from academia. Ten were coming from the economy. And ten were coming from social civil society. And there will be agriculture. We will happen to be with visitors on a higher up or in the middle of the city. Farmers, do you want to meet? Do you want to be part of the ten digital council with us? Of course not. No fee around internet or anything. But I thought it was a super great innovative thing to do. And this was the type of event that I wanted them to do. Same thing for a doctor, and same thing as well, is that if you want to build a concept on a society that is sustainable and that is inclusive, well, you need to have around the table people who today are the main decision makers. And so around the table, there is people coming from the countryside, but also people coming from the poor neighborhoods and from women of different color, so people who are advanced today for very little statistics on the decisions that they need to have. So not a lot of independent business statistics since I research, but there's some. And those, those little numbers we have really tell us in terms of what is concerning the state of living and the poverty level to also the Schengen community or the East Coast. And so I wanted to have a black leader, I wanted to have a direct effect on the city center um, to really have a vision coming from all the different types of society, including people who do want to work with us. Um, and my second or kind of third main today had had a phone call to say, you know, we have to with black leaders with the ground. Because there were people coming from very close to the government saying that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be able to have so many people in 
women's position because he was saying things like, well, I'm actually a religious woman. His personal relations with Ms. Brown were very clear. And he isn't a sin to the Department of State of Homeland Security, and they will not act upon him based on what he can say. And so I was asked to file her criminal case file that she could go to with this independent counsel that was united with all the different cases at hand and address this common business that there was in this town and women living in Quebec and this is what they were doing. And so I, I just couldn't do it. And it was for me that it was surmounting to this day this principle of dignity and to respond in that quiet way. And it wasn't possible. I tried twice to convince the Liberal government saying, well, if you think that your voice is, will overcome all other voices in the council, just pick a, somebody else on the council that you believe is sane and the other people say that's not fair. I will be the sane one. And of course, you know, then that one voice gets invited and, and the school could discuss this tomorrow with the town and say, do you need to say that and you're not here and then we have to have a debate and this is the situation we have to deal with. So why? Why don't you listen to me? You know? And so they were not able to do it. And so what happened is that since I had called everybody on the council that I saw and told them the truth of the information, um, I just had them leaning on me. Well, what I did was I came up to a point where I knew I had to leave. There was no other way. But I couldn't make that decision myself because I had convinced the Center for the Legal Center. But I sent a mail saying, you know, this is the situation. We're come to a dead end from my perspective. I didn't see any other choice than just to leave. But I'll, I'm open to the discussion and I, I've been listening to the point of view. And so I invited everybody at my house in my home on the Sunday night to discuss this. And we, we had never met the three of us, right? There was not even the time to do that because there was, there was such a strong case to be brought up and to even have it. And you know, interesting thing to understand is when she was announced, the only case that we had on the social media was um, to spotlight the matter. Um, and so Anthony was saying, why are you working with this crazy government? Building blocks. Right? And she was defending, she had some doubts in her, but then he was telling her, no, this is what I believe I can do best and because she wants me to hold the problem, right? Um, and so then they trust me and they we're going to settle the, you know, she is she in the fact that she wants to hold the system hostage for her and she's not. And I was trying to convince them. And so, you know, that's the best thing I can do for you. And so we came to that situation where everybody came to my house and we discussed what we could do. We didn't find any solution. And so then I convinced. On the Monday, I resigned and the full council was on the Monday. So the other message is, actually, when you do have an issue in your council, um, that you're sincere and clear about it, you know, you have a lot of time to convince people to have a council. And this, even in tough situations like this, is possible. So having this, you know, this willingness of making things happen and of explaining and having this participation actually was a natural leadership thing because people were following me. What it told me is that what happened after the whole celebrity resigned is I got as many love messages on Twitter as I had Facebook pages on Twitter. And it was to the bank. And the only thing I had done, I didn't tell everybody because that's what you're supposed to do in a hospital. The only thing I did was to create a social media. And so it was super hard to realize the state of activism that was violent about it. Right? Both Twitter and my Facebook. And people 
have in mind is two steps. Assess the fact that these actions are happening in the home of God. This complete denial is super, um, it's, it's very bizarre because we don't know what to expect from God either. One thing we know is that um, the, the lucidity that comes in is, is very hard because you know you can really come and tell your real thoughts and feelings and then you can keep quiet and people don't mind you. And this means to me that as we listen and come and tell think that we are not and that the current system that is in place is a lot of people do not want to be friends with one another and these people are in conflict with God and so when you become close it can, you cannot turn from that so the lucidity that comes with that is that means that the time is spent actually needs to be spent on the things that matter. And the things that you're actually going to care about is how it's looking at you. Because when you're looking at things as important as social justice, as important as making sure that you live in the time that God has put you in and you live in the home of God, and making sure that there is still a place for the next step and a place for the future. This is deception because that means you need to dig a bit deeper to find the answer. And it's kind of like um, it's a good thing that can um, happen, but it's also the things that are that are pulling at you in the sense that it's your deep at heart and deep important passion. Like that is in your own way and your own style. And the freedom part that I eventually have built throughout um, my career is when you write. It actually comes from different things. The first thing is I was always the only woman in the room for the men's classes when I started. So obviously I needed to be the one to look in and be the first to come out and I'm the only woman. And I struggled like that. And there was no other woman with me I could look at. And one because they were fine. Um, I, I, I have no role model, basically, and so what it brought me was the fact that there was no truth in the way I wanted to see myself and the way I could see myself. It brought me different things. One is I was always the target of abuse, and so it's like, and it's been embarrassing. I mean, I didn't blame anybody. It's just like this, right? I'm being carried on in a good way by the parents and by my genetic parents. But it doesn't make sense because I'm the only one to look at. It's just not how it was. It is a part of the thing. And so the question is, what do you do? What do you do with that? What do you do with that? And what I tended to do is think I don't have a choice. I don't have a sponsor. So so I got more stuff to the time that I got help. I was relevant because I wanted to be seen and I wanted to get help and I wanted to get help. And so that brought to me basically a different agenda than in the world. But that also brought me a way of saying, you know, what I say and why and how I say it and why. And this is part of the reason that I've been getting my role and I'm questioning it is that nobody ever told me this is the way. So I'm like, going to keep a paper, and that was actually for me a friendly paper to what I was doing. The second thing that brought me freedom is the fact that I was successful at the time to people, so I invested and I was glad that I was given a fresh start of my career because I didn't know what to say. And um, 10 years later, the first thing on the law got, and now I'm here. It was a very big change for me. And that was part of the reason I got accurate um, friends. I was given the million dollar friends, um, which is some, 
something nobody else did before. And so that brought me through to my ex because of I was the person who was winning, which means that I actually had more bragging and more ability to do things because I didn't have to do it. And the last thing was my concern that I would be what my ex deemed me as, which was I'm not that pretty and I'm not that hot. I think that is what I am. And that's my conclusion when someone finds out that I'm saying that. Thank you very much.
Christian worship comes from the heart. And so for those of us who are in the front line in the church of the day,
<laughs> yeah. There you go. But the bird showed himself. Left him by the side of it. I also learned very early on because I had decided um, not to follow the advice of many people. I was considered by some of my neighbors. I had people halfway through my career asking me that why didn't you do any studies? Study, have a degree. Exactly. And people, no, 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 but getting a full diploma will be great for you. You're the most intelligent, you know? And I was like, what? No. So this was before the guidance from the parents was even provided. It was in my research. So also understanding what the other people believe is a good idea and how strong it must be. Because once you give that hope and that you realize that you could find me or find the right option, then you will find it. And and I found it in my mind. Okay. But then once you make that decision, you take a risky decision. You say, well, of course you take a risk because it's your first job. So that's an interesting thing. So my father was a big risky man. He did very risky decisions and he was um, he was the heart of the faith of the family. And he never took a loss. And he was the one who was the main breadwinner, I guess. And my mother was really the one who was running the house. And she was <laughs> at least smart. <laughs> And that's why you, both of them really risked it and never took a loss. But it was my decision. So this is something that I've seen with what they told me. 